Her came out and admitted that she's got bipolar 2 disorder, which is kind of interesting. And of course, what, what are we talking about today? We're, we're going to talk about bipolar disorder. So I'm sure that the reason that she decided to come out yesterday and say that she had bipolar disorder is so that it could be in my lecture today. Uh, <laughs> she has, uh, does anybody know anybody else with bipolar disorder? A lot of, especially bipolar too. Anybody know anybody else? Demi Lovato, you, you ever heard of that lady? Demi Lovato, you never heard of Demi Lovato? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Catherine Zeta-Jones? Yeah. Everybody thinks she's Hispanic, she's from Wales? She's a Brit. <clears throat> anyway, okay. Uh, okay, so what is bipolar disorder? Bipolar, the reason they call it bipolar disorder is because you have emotions that, uh, uh, that have something to do with both, both ends of the spectrum. You have mania and you also have depression. Bipolar 1 disorder is the worst. It is the worst of the bipolar disorders. Uh, it's distinguished from other mood disorders by occurrence of a manic episode at some point of the condition. Uh, a lot of people have major depressive disorder. Uh, and we think of them as having major depressive disorder. Uh, if at some point during their lives they also have a manic episode, then we will diagnose them, potentially we'll diagnose them <coughs> with manic depressive, with uh, mania and with uh, major depression or bipolar disorder. And if, if it is severe, uh, if it's severe mania, if it's severe uh, depression, uh, then we will diagnose them with uh, uh, bipolar 1 disorder. More than 9 to 10 of 10 have a second episode uh, of individuals who have mania. Uh, if you have had one uh, episode of mania, you have a 90% chance of having a second episode of mania. A lot of these individuals that have a manic episode will end up in jail. Uh, if we have not diagnosed them with uh, bipolar disorder, they'll, they will definitely end up in jail. Uh, usually they do something erratic uh, and they uh, are taken off to, to uh, jail <clears throat> to control their behavior. Uh, most 60% uh, to 70% of these individuals will also experience a major depressive episode, thus the term bipolar referring to the two poles of mania and depression. So 60% to 70% will have another depressive episode. And Chris is here. This is the best part of my day, Chris. How you doing? Good. So we saved this just for you. I could have you know, passed it around earlier. Uh, on average, people with bipolar <coughs> 1 disorder experience about four occurrences in 10 years. So normally with uh, bipolar 1 disorder, we don't see a, 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 lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of episodes. Uh, potentially, we don't see a lot of episodes, which is a good thing, because when they are depressed, they have to be hospitalized. When they are manic, potentially they have to be hospitalized as well. <laughs> Uh, there was a famous French author, and I can't remember the guy's name, that's how famous he was. Uh, he, was a, he was a playwright, uh, and he uh, couldn't write. I mean, a lot of the times he couldn't write. A lot of the times he was normal, uh, but sometimes he would go into depression. And when he was very, very depressed, he'd be suicidal. Uh, and, uh, of course, they kept him from committing suicide. His wife stayed on top of him. There, were always some, there was always somebody around making sure he didn't off himself. Uh, anyway, but when he had his manic episodes, he would find himself a, uh, a hot young lady. <laughs> He'd find himself a girlfriend, okay? Uh, usually it was one of his actresses, and he would start having an affair with her. And while he was having an affair with this lady, uh, he would write his next play. Uh, so sometimes, and of course, when they were having financial problems, his wife was hoping that he would find himself a girlfriend so he could go out and write another play so that they could have money. I know, it's kind of, kind of weird. Ah, uh, the French there are so interesting with people, aren't they? Uh, so, so very different from everybody else. Anyway, he, he would write uh, when he was having his manic episodes. Uh, eventually, he did commit suicide. Uh, he uh, ran away with somebody, uh, with a young lady. He wrote his play. Uh, he didn't quite have it finished yet. And she left him, uh, and his wife couldn't find him, and he killed himself. That's an interesting thing. <laughs> Sounds like an opera, doesn't it? Uh, anyway, he, he eventually killed himself. I, I need to find out what that guy's name was. 
Uh, I read about that in, in another abnormal psychology book. As much fun as that is. If there, if there are cycles of both manic and, and major depressive episodes, uh, it is described by its most recent episode, if it, was, if it was a hypomanic episode or manic episode or depressed episode, that's how we identify it. Uh, when the uh, uh, with rapid cycling specifier applies, at least four mood episodes have been experienced within the past year. And normally, of course, uh, you'll just have one of these episodes a year, but sometimes it will happen uh, one right after the other. And if that happens, of course, when we talk about uh, uh, the individual having rapid cycling, he's got with rapid cycling. Additional moods may be experienced concurrently with a manic episode. Uh, their presence determines whether the bipolar one disorder uh, is specified with mixed features. And of course, that is another specifier that from time to time we will use. Mood shifts may be rapid between the manic and the depressed states, with each sometimes lasting only a few hours. Uh, if this happens, we refer to it as rapid, rapid cycling, uh, where they are, they are rapid cycling from depression to, uh, to uh, manic episode, uh, which is really kind of irritating if you've ever been around one of these individuals. Uh, it's like you're chasing after them while they're in their manic stage, and all of a sudden they get depressed, and now you're chasing, trying to chase them down going in the other direction. It's really kind of bizarre. Bipolar 1 disorder occurs in approximately 0.6% of the population, so this isn't that common. Uh, bipolar 1 disorder uh, incidence appears to be about uh, equal for males and females. Now, as we talk about other bipolar disorders, uh, we're, it's primarily with females, but bipolar 1 disorder, we see this very, it's relatively common uh, in both males and females, or it, it, it is as common in males as it is in females. Uh, individuals who have uh, bipolar one disorder uh, uh, brand what, Neville not Neville what is that guy's name he was he was the rabbit in hop uh, black hair he's an Englishman he's goofy he's really really goofy um, uh, Robin Williams had bipolar one disorder uh, who else uh, Winston Churchill had bipolar one disorder as well okay. some some of the men that have had it. And there was a guy off of a soap opera that I didn't even recognize. Of course, I don't watch soap opera, so is that guy's name. Uh, he was on television for a while. He's, he's an Englishman with a really strong accent and goofy, just goofy is all that up. He was dating somebody famous, and uh, she broke up with him because he's so crazy. He was doing all kinds of stupid stuff. And drugs. He was heavily into heroin, which is always fun for everybody. Uh, bipolar 1 disorder can develop at any age, but the average age of onset is about 18 years. Uh, substance use disorders are, are often co-occur with the disorder, and the conditions may exacerbate each other. As a matter of fact, when we talk about Robin Williams, uh, we can't talk about Robin Williams without talking about his cocaine addiction. And of course, it may have been uh, a relapse in his cocaine addiction that caused his suicide. <coughs> Uh, these guys commit suicide a lot, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, remember, the human brain wants to be normal, uh, so we will do anything we can. He can stay. <laughs> you don't have to go. He can stay. That's okay. Uh, the human brain w wants to be normal, and, and we will do anything to make ourselves feel better. This is one of the reasons why a lot of the mental illnesses, we see uh, a co-morbid, uh, um, uh, uh, a co-occurrence of drug addiction as well, or using one type of drug over another. Uh, remember the uh, people with schizophrenia, we see a lot of individuals that smoke tobacco. Uh, why? Because it raises the dopamine level and they have all these dopamine receptor sites. So it makes them feel normal. It actually occupies, occupies some of the receptor sites so they don't feel as erratic as they did before. So they smoke, they chain smoke, they don't just smoke. These people will light one cigarette off of the other. And they will do this as long as they're awake. They don't sleep as much. Uh, and that may be causing, and it may exacerbate their, their schizophrenia because, they are, uh, because they're not getting enough REM sleep. And that makes them even more schizophrenic as bizarre as that is. So we see this a lot, especially with bipolar disorder. Uh, who else had bipolar disorder? Uh, Ernest Hemingway, uh, alcoholic. He was an alcoholic. 
Uh, so if you have to stay drunk in order to feel normal, you're going to, you're going to stay drunk. So a lot of times we see people with, uh, with <coughs> mental illnesses that we're not recognizing as, or we see people with, uh, with drug problems that we're not recognizing as having mental illnesses. They are using the, the, uh, the alcohol or whatever the substance is uh, to mask their symptoms. And for that reason, of course, uh, so which do you treat first? Do you treat their, their drug addiction or do you treat their mental illness first? Somebody comes in and they're an alcoholic and they're also bipolar. So what do you, which do you treat first? Try to save their life first, right? Yeah, That's let's save their life. Good idea. Let's save their life. How are we going to do that? Which one do we treat first? Drug addiction. Yeah, we better treat their drug addiction first. You can't even deal with their mental illness until you fix, you, you cure their drug addiction. And that's what happened with Robin Williams. He had to go off cocaine before, uh, before they could treat his bipolar disorder. Uh, famous author who was also bipolar was uh, Kurt Vonnegut. And uh, he came out of World War II. Uh, he was actually in the firebombing of Dresden. Uh, came out of World War II with all kinds of interesting problems. Uh, started drinking heavily, uh, hard stuff, not, he, he wasn't a beer drinker, he wasn't a wine drinker, he drank really hard, hard liquor. Uh, and he stayed drunk a lot, and he wrote really, really well when he was in his manifest, <coughs> his bipolar. Uh, they couldn't start treating his uh, bipolar disorder until they, they cured his alcoholism. So they, they, they dealt with his alcoholism. Uh, then they dealt with his uh, uh, bipolar disorder, and he never wrote again. He could only write in the manic phase. It's really kind of bizarre. Yes, sir? What are some of the triggers for uh, man, bipolar episodes in man, like the microaggressions? Mm -hmm. Stress. Stress? Yeah, whatever. Yeah, stress. It's usually stress. Uh, somebody like, uh, I was reading about uh, Catherine Zeta Jones and what happened to her. Uh, Catherine Zeta Jones married a man who was already married. Wait a minute. He'd been married before, uh, Michael Douglas, uh, who, and he had like six kids. Uh, so his first wife uh, s kept suing him for the money that he was making off of all these movies that he made while they were married. Um, and uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones got involved in all this, and the stress from dealing with the ex-wife is what kicked her into bipolar disorder. And of course, the first episode was depression. She, she had a depressive episode. Uh, but she was another individual that the only way that she could act, the only way that she could perform was when she was in the manic phase. And so um, for that reason, after she developed, or, or after the, the bipolar disorder manifested itself, uh, she could only work when she was up, not when she couldn't work when she was down. So she didn't make very many movies after that. I think she made Chicago. Uh, was one of the movies that she made after they diagnosed her with bipolar disorder. I, I was just pictured or assumed, I guess, that bipolar was something that uh, happened in short phases. Is it something that is it can be. drawn out or yeah. both? It can be. And, and one of them is short cycling. Um, some people short cycle, and other people, their cycles are much longer. Uh, what did it say? Uh, average of four in ten years. So sometimes, I mean, a lot of times they're normal, and usually it's because they're they're taking their medication. Um, they are, uh, but these guys go off their medication as well. And the the, bi the individual bipolar disorder, the reason he goes, they go off their medication, is because they are uh, they like the manic phase. They really love the manic. Phase. Uh, that's when they're, they, that's, that they feel like they're on speed. So as with the, the author that I was talking about before, the, the playwright, the only time he could uh, write a play was when he was having an affair with somebody and was in the manic phase. And it was the same way with Kurt Vonnegut. If you read the novels he wrote after he started getting treatment for, uh, for bipolar disorder, they're terrible. They're just not any good. And before that, every time, every, all of his novels were just hits. Bam, 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 bam. He gets treated for bipolar disorder, all of a sudden, his, his writing is crap. So, it's really kind of this interesting situation. Does adrenaline have anything to do with it? 
Well, it has to do with stress. It has to do with cortisol. Cortisol. Yeah, so potentially, potentially yes, it does have to do with adrenaline. I just ask because I know sometimes that, uh, well, when, when you said it with the, uh, <laughs> they, they, they crave it. Like right. It. Yeah, they they, they so like they, the manifest. They, exactly. Maybe if they get into an argument with someone and right. it brings up that adrenaline or that cortisol and then all of a sudden it can trigger up. And actually we're going to talk about that in just a second. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and talking about bipolar one disorder. All right. Uh, in contrast to bipolar one disorder, uh, bipolar two disorder uh, does not involve a manic episode. Uh, bipolar 2 uh, individuals experience a less severe hypomanic episode uh, interspersed with major depressive episodes. Uh, so because of this, uh, we see this almost exclusively in females. Uh, major depressive episode uh, and their manic phase is not nearly as, as extreme as it is with people with bipolar 1 disorder. This is what uh, uh, Mariah Carey has. She has bipolar 2 disorder. So does Catherine Zeta-Jones. And so does Demi Lovato. And this is one of the reasons, well, and one of the reasons is because they will go into a deep depression. Uh, if you look at uh, Mariah Carey's history, uh, she has canceled a lot of, of her um, uh, concerts. And the reason she's done that is because she dipped into a major depressive episode. She was being treated for depression. And it didn't work. And that's one of the reasons why they diagnosed her with bipolar 2 disorder because she uh, was having uh, uh, cyclothymic, I'm sorry, hypomanic uh, episodes. Uh, the major depressive episode is necessary for the diagnosis of bipolar 2, unlike bipolar 1. Uh, bipolar 2 disorders is more common among females, as I said before. Bipolar 2 patients may be more impaired, spending about 40% more time in depressive states than bipolar 1 patients. And for this reason, we're treating them for depression far more than we're treating them for, for bipolar disorder. And that, that it's not working. And that's one of the reasons why we're, uh, we're uh, uh, diagnosing them as having bipolar 2 disorder. Yes, sir. Is that related to like, the chemical difference, makeup difference between males and females? Like the production of estrogen and... Uh, estrogen, yeah, the, uh, the hormonal cycles, uh, which is really kind of interesting because we see this more in uh, uh, women in their... Uh, in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Uh, there are uh, women that are older than that who've gone through menopause and they're still suffering from bipolar 2 disorder. Uh, but one of the ways that we're treating those women is with estrogen therapy, which is really kind of interesting. Has anyone ever suggested that the difference in the brain can cause that too? You know, they have the, women have the, the area in the middle, I forget what it's called. Corpus is callosum. Is yeah. larger than the yeah. Well, that's a possibility. I don't know that anybody has, has uh, said anything about it. Um, not, not that I'm aware of. Not, not that I've read. Which doesn't mean that it's not out there. It just means that I haven't read it. Okay. Uh, the diagnostic reliability of bipolar 2 disorder is not well established. According to Lieberman, Peel, and Razavi in 2008, there are mathematically as many as 163 symptom combinations that could qualify as a manic episode and more than 37,000 uh, for dsm 4 mixed episode before specifiers are applied. And this is the problem. We have so many different symptoms that can uh, uh, be diagnosed this way. So as, as we have talked before, uh, Chris and I, every time we look at a patient, uh, he says one thing and I say something totally different. And it's, it's not his fault, it's not my fault. It's just two people looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, and when you have all of this symptomology, look at this, 163 symptoms, 37,000 combinations, the probability of two people uh, interpreting things incorrectly or differently is, is fairly high. And that's the reason why, why Mariah Carey over the last 17 years has been diagnosed with all of these different problems. We knew that she was depressed. Uh, we knew that she had major depressive disorder, but we, we didn't know, and she wasn't really responding very well uh, to, uh, to the medication, uh, SSRI. She wasn't responding to it. Uh, so they tried her on tricyclics. They tried her on monoamine oxida oxidase inhibitors. Uh, she wasn't really responding very well to those. Uh, but now she's starting to respond to the uh, uh, 
lithium carbonate. And lithium carbonate, of course, is what we treat. Uh, it's what we treat bipolar disorder. So sometimes it has to do, it doesn't have to do as much with the diagnosis as what the medications they're, they're responding to. And that's what we've done uh, with Mariah Carey. And like I said, it came out yesterday uh, that she has bipolar 2 disorder. Uh, total uh, possible symptoms and specifier combinations for all of the bipolar conditions exceeds 5 billion. So you can imagine how difficult it is to be very specific as to what we're dealing with. If there are really 5 billion symptoms that we could look at, and 5 billion different combinations that we could look at, is it possible that we're dealing with a lot of different, more than, than uh, three or four different types of, of uh, mental illness here? I mean, if we were looking at 5 billion different symptom uh, combinations. Yes, sir? I think you just shattered my myth about Roma. <laughs> with this information, I think looking at this, I, I think everybody has issues, and so most of us are functional. Yeah, well, and, and if we're functional, then we're not going to diagnose you with anything. I mean, that would be silly. It's when when you start having a problem and you come in and talk to us, then then we have to diagnose you with something. Okay. And if you if you respond to medication, yeah, sure, okay, then. Obviously, I was right with my diagnosis. But if you're not responding to, to uh, what I'm diagnosing you as having, then yeah. It's gonna, it has to be something else. It has to be something that responds to this medication. But as we have found out with depression, with anxiety, with, there's only a select percentage of individuals that actually respond the way we think they will. Everybody is different. If everybody in the room had bipolar disorder, uh, and we and I tried to give all of you the, exactly the same medication at the same levels. Then some of you would respond to it, and some of you wouldn't. As, as strange as that is. Does it depend on the male or female? It does. It does. And that's the huge. Of the medication. Right. Well, not only that, but if you're taking medication and then you go into your period, guess what? <laughs> I'm going to be over. I'm going to be overstimulated. With, with with the medication. So do I do I give you medication that works when you're in your period or when you're not in your period? And everybody's on a different cycle. And everybody's on a different cycle. How long is your cycle going to take? My goodness. And if you switch, it takes time for it to build up in your system again. And it does. It takes six, may, may take as much as six weeks. Wow. Yeah, exactly. So it really all depends. Do they ever do it by body weight too? No. Yeah, well, we have to. Oh, okay. Yeah, usually we do. So we wouldn't give the children the same uh, the same level of medication that we give to adults. We can't do that. And actually, we try not to give psychotropic medications to children anyway. The only one that we give readily is Ritalin and, and uh, any of the uh, ADHD drugs. But we'll be talking about ADHD drugs when we talk about ADHD. There's Demi Lovato. She is suffering from bipolar two disorder. Uh, Mariah Carey. Uh, I kept, uh, Mariah Carey is really kind of interesting. So if you look at, at pictures of, of Mariah Carey, Mariah Carey, sometimes yeah, she has a lot of cleavage, and sometimes she has no cleavage. Well, the only time you can really find her with no cleavage is when they, they're just taking a face shot of her. Uh, and the reason I say that is because when she's showing a lot of skin, is potentially when she's in her manic phase not in her depressive phase. But then again, we probably don't even see her when she's having her, uh, in, in her depressive stage. Maybe here in this picture. <clears throat> was she di undiagnosed for a long time? A long time. Well, yeah, we, we diagnosed her, well, we, what am I talking about? <laughs> Chris, and I, Chris and I were working on this case. And <laughs> we diagnosed her with major depressive disorder. Isn't that what we were? We <laughs> <barely. laughs> Yeah, for for the last 17 years, we have known that she had a, she had a problem. Uh, and if you uh, read anything about her, then you knew that she. This is the reason that she missed uh, this uh, concert and that concert and whatnot. I, mean, I think, like in layman's terms, you know, just in everyday language, they just always called her a diva because she was always like, right. she would act out. Exactly. Exactly. And she just had a reputation for that. Right. Right. But it was her bipolar disorder. It was her bipolar disorder. And that's one of the reasons why she was showing so much skin. 
We see the same thing with other, ag other actresses and other singers. Uh, Cher, for example. Sometimes, geez, she almost goes out naked. I think even her ex-husband said when they divorced, right. was talking about the, right. the roller coaster. Exactly. Kind of sometimes she's just a wild child. And some, sometimes you couldn't get her you know, even react to you. So, yeah. Uh, her weight. Uh, some of the medications she was taking was making her gain weight. Uh, now that they've diagnosed her with bipolar, or actually they diagnosed her alone. They diagnosed her uh, a number of months ago, and they started treating her a number of months ago. And if you look at pictures of her now, this is this is her when she was a little bit pudgy, and one of the reasons was because she was she was on uh, antidepressants, uh, and it slows you down, and it also uh, makes you gain water water weight. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why her her weight was so uh, fluctuating from one one point to another, and she wouldn't uh, she wouldn't sing. She wouldn't go out on stage when she was felt puffy. But she would act. That's the weird part. So you can see her in movies or in, or, you know, in, in television shows uh, when she was kind of ch chubby. And that's because she was on her antidepressants. As strange as that may seem. Anyway. And of course, the last one is C Catherine Zeta Jones. And uh, she's also one that. Uh, if she's showing a lot of cleavage, then potentially it's because she's in one of her manic phases, as bizarre and strange as that may seem. I know. They're more outgoing when they're in their manic phase. Well, I think we're lucky that they had clothes yeah. on when they're in the manic phase. Yeah. I mean, they're, yeah, they feel like showing off. Anyway, okay, cyclothymic disorder is a third type of bipolar disorder. It does not involve a manic or a hypomanic or a major depressive episode. Hypomanic symptoms uh, that may never meet the, the full criteria for, for a hypomanic episode alternate with depressive symptoms, which also may not uh, meet the full criteria for major depressive episode. These mood swings last at least two years and they cause significant distress or dysfunction. Cyclothymic disorder is where they have the blues and then sometimes they're, they're uh, hypomanic to some extent. So this is like the minor leagues of uh, bipolar one, bipolar two. Bipolar one, you have major depressive disorder and you have mania. In uh, bipolar disorder two, you have uh, hypomania and major depressive disorder. And in cyclothymia, you have low level uh, depression and you have low level mania. And that's the cyclothymia. Now the strange thing is that you, this has to last for at least two years. Or I guess that's not that strange. But it usually lasts for, for uh, uh, up to two years. So you have to see this in two-year increments. Cyclothymic disorder is relatively rare in the general population, although it's more common, up to 5%, among those in treatment for mood disorders. Now, why in the world are we seeing this more with people that are treat being treated for mood disorders? Well, the individuals that we're, we're seeing being treated for mood disorders are individuals that are depressed. And so we, uh, we, we are misdiagnosing them. And this potentially, of course, is what was happening with Mariah Carey. Sometimes you just get a misdiagnosis. Uh, but let's, let's not attack all the psychologists for missing the diagnosis. The reality is you come in when you don't feel good. So all we're actually getting is a snapshot. Today, you act like this. Tomorrow, you may act like something else. And you want me to diagnose you from when you don't feel good. So what's the probability I'm going to get, I'm going to get the right answer? It's not really very high, unless you tell me the right story. Unless you tell me the entire story. The reality may be that you're, what, the story that you tell me is going to be the story that you want me to hear. And you're going to ignore all the stuff that you don't want me to know. Oh, I can't have sex with my husband uh, on select night. Uh, well, you're not going to give me that information. You don't want to even talk about that. So I don't have that piece of information. Uh, you're not going to tell me that, that uh, sometimes on the weekends uh, you go out and hang glide. You're not going to give me that information. You're not going to tell me when you feel good. You're only going to tell me when you feel bad. So what are you going to tell me about? You're going to tell me about your depressive symptoms. So in order to diagnose these individuals, 
a, a uh, psychologist has to look at them over a two-year period. And normally they're not going to tell him when they don't feel bad. And when they are in their hypomanic phase, or e even in their manic phase, they're not even going to talk about that. For probably because they don't think of, of it as, as anything negative, but it also may be that they're afraid that you're going to take it away from them. Because you can give them medication that will make them will make their manic phase uh, less severe. Okay, so we're, we're not going to get all the information, and this is kind of a, a sad and strange situation. So a lot of times we're going to give uh, the wrong diagnosis, and it's not our fault. We're only, we are only able to diagnose what the, with the information that you give us. So we'll have you fill out a history, but it's not going to ask you how often you feel good. It's not going to be there. And if you're in the, in the manic phase, of course, you're going to feel pretty good. Uh, one of the reasons we ask you about the drugs that you take is because that can indicate to us whether you're depressed or whether you're manic or, or whether you have a problem. Because most people self-medicate. They'll do whatever it takes to make themselves feel better. Remember, the brain wants to be normal. So you'll do whatever you have to do. Uh, for the longest time, we didn't recognize uh, smoking, to smoking tobacco uh, especially chain smoking as a, a as a problem with individuals who had uh, schizophrenia but now of course we do now we recognize that as a possible symptom of people with schizophrenia estimates uh, from a representative sample of over 9,000 people in the United States estimated lifetime prevalence of about 1% for bipolar 1 disorder 1.1% for bipolar 2 disorder and 2.4% for sub-threshold bipolar spectrum disorders, in other words, cyclothymic disorders. Uh, so there are a lot of people out there, there are al almost as many people out there with a form of bipolar disorder as there are people with bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder. Cyclothymic disorders diagnosed more commonly in females, of course. Uh, so once again, we have, uh, we have bipolar 1 disorder that's uh, about even as far as males and females are concerned, but bipolar 2 disorder, almost twice as many females, and uh, with uh, cyclothymic disorder, uh, more prevalent in females as well. Uh, between 15% and 50% of those with cyclothymic disorder subsequently develop either bipolar 1 disorder or bipolar 2 disorder. So how in the world do we treat cy cyclothymic disorder? How would you treat that cyclothymic disorder? What would you do? Marijuana. Marijuana <laughs> works every time. It's probably the best mint no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Marijuana is con contraindicated as far as cyclothymic disorder is concerned. And the problem with marijuana is that uh, you can't smoke all the time. As long as you were smoking marijuana and were under the influence of marijuana, yeah, it would, it would help your symptomology. But once you stop smoking, yeah, we get the opposite effect. We get a rebound effect. You can eat it. You can eat it now, yeah. It'll make you stupid, but that's it. <laughs> it hurts your, your short-term memory. It'll cause psychotic disorder, right? I'm sorry? When you say it causes psychotic disorder, Right, potentially, yeah, exactly. It, it, it can kick you into schizophrenia. And we would yeah. give you a medication. Well, we try not to anyway. So how would you treat this stuff? We get, we've got special medications for, uh, for bipolar 1 and bipolar 2, but how about cyclothymic disorder? It's low-level depression. It's low-level mania. So how would we treat it? How would you treat it? Therapy might work. Could, could potentially work. Actually, therapy works a lot better than people think it does. Sometimes the only reason you have a mental illness is because you don't have anybody to talk to. So sometimes we can fix you just by talking to people. So if you're somebody's friend and somebody calls you up on the telephone sometimes, just think of yourself as a therapist because that may be what you're doing. I like you guys. And the reason I like you guys is because you let me talk. When, whenever I'm talking to somebody else, I never get a word in edgewise. Sheldon. <laughs> he, 
He came to my office today. I think I said three words the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that was you. Yeah, that was me. That's my fault. Yeah, that's my fault. They just talked about his paper. Uh, I told you about that lady that wouldn't let me say anything. She thought I was the most brilliant person in the world because I got my mouth shut. <laughs> so how would you treat him? How would, what would you give him? I'm sorry. Yeah, we're gonna well, let's raise their serotonin. S SSRI is probably the best thing to do. Let's just raise their serotonin level and see if that doesn't help things. Now, when they go into their manic phase, of course, the uh, SSRI isn't going to help them. But that's okay. It's only the low level. Uh, it's only hypomania anyway. Uh, so we won't even worry about it. Okay. They like that feeling anyway. If we took that feeling away from them, they would stop taking their medication. And potentially it's going to do that. The serotonin is going to lower or the SSR. Is it medication by pills or is it by injection? No, it's... it's uh, uh, the other problem is, but there's, there are side effects to SSRIs. It raises your serotonin level. Serotonin controls your testosterone and your hypothalamus. Well, that represents your sex drive, and if we, if we raise your serotonin level, potentially what we're going to do is stop the individual's sex drive. We'll lower their sex drive, okay. depending on how young they are. Well, anyway, we won't get into that. Uh, <laughs> cycle of, <laughs> uh, between 50, uh, between 50% and 50% of those, okay, they, they eventually will develop the bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder, and that's okay. Uh, because we're treating them right now, and we're making them feel good. Okay, we're making them feel better today, and that's a good thing. Uh, other disorders uh, include uh, substance medication induced bipolar and related disorders. Remember, a lot of these individuals are taking drugs; they're self-medicating. So, a lot of these individuals will have exacerbated symptoms when they're on whatever drugs they're on. Uh, so, what kind of drugs would you expect these people to be on? Opioids, uh, potentially, sure, yeah, that, because that makes you numb. <clears throat> yeah, and the reason they use methamphetamines is because of their depression. They're trying to pull themselves out of their depression. They don't mind the manic phase. They love the manic phase. It makes them feel like they're on speed anyway. So methamphetamines, right. Uh, and this, this was potentially part of the problem with... Uh, uh, Robin Williams, if you remember his comedy, uh, you know, every, it was like machine gun comedy. Uh, he was just, words just flew out of his mouth. I wish I could talk about that. Everybody wishes they were that funny. But uh, his, his problem was he was, he was having manic, manic episodes and he was also using, uh, he was using cocaine. So he was uh, making himself psychotic. And he seemed psychotic sometimes, especially on work and Mindy. He seemed psychotic sometimes. What are we doing? Uh, bi uh, bipolar and related disorders due to other medical conditions. So if you have a blow to the head, potentially you're going to have problems. Uh, so and it may uh, uh, manifest itself uh, looking like a bipolar disorder. Uh, other specified bipolar and related disorders. This includes conditions in which um, hypomanic episodes are of brief duration or that do not occur with uh, depressive episodes or cyclothymia uh, thymia that does not persist for a full two years. And we can call it other specified bipolar spectrum disorders. Evidence for genetic etiology is stronger for bipolar one disorder than other mood disorders. So if we look at depression, no, not so much. Schizophrenia. No, not really. But bipolar disorder is fairly uh, is fairly uh, common uh, with individuals that have a first degree relative with the problem. The relatives of bipolar one individuals have as much as ten times the risk of also showing a bipolar condition as the general population. Uh, so, whereas uh, if you have depression in your family or schizophrenia in your family, it's not that high. The probability of you having the same problem that, that individual has is not that great, but if you have bipolar disorder, this one does have a genetic component, and it seems to be very, very strong. A large Danish uh, twin study indicated 62% concordance in monozygotic twins versus 8% concordance in dizygotic twins. So we, this is very, very common. 
uh, as far as uh, relatives having the same problem that you have. Risk for bipolar 2 disorders increased in relatives of those with uh, bipolar 1 disorder. Uh, remember, bipolar 2 disorder is more common in females than it is with males. No gene has consistently be, been implicated as causal. Uh, sites on chromosomes 4, 12, 18, and 21, as well as the X chromosome, and genes related to the serotonergic and dopaminergic uh, systems may be linked to bipolar disorder. We're not exactly sure. But like we said, we, you saw the combinations, 5 billion combinations, and 163 combinations. That's a lot. So we may be looking at more than one problem here. Uh, the current understanding is that multiple genes interact with each other and the environment in complex and unknown ways, and that's why we can't pin it down. Bipolar 1 disorder is characterized by abnormalities in the uh, uh, HPA activity system. Uh, manic episodes may uh, be preceded by increased cortisol levels, and that's what uh, Emery was saying. Uh, stressful life events tend to correspond with the onset of mania in people with bipolar 1 uh, disorder. And actually, I think what he was saying, what he was trying to get at was sometimes in a uh, uh, in adrenaline-induced uh, situation, uh, people act manic. Uh, and I've seen that myself. Uh, <laughs> I've seen that myself. We won't go into it, what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, and it has to do with uh, epinephrine. It has to do with uh, uh, the fact that when they are in a, in a stressful situation, uh, sometimes they get overly excited and they do something like uh, run out in the middle of, of, of a firefight and, and try to and charge uh, the, the uh, guns or whatever. Uh, we see that from time to time. And it looks like suicide, but the reality is the guy is just really, really excited. Uh, stressful events, life events tend to correspond with the onset of mania in people with bipolar 1 disorder. Bipolar 1 disorder is twice as common in high income countries. Uh, there is evidence for the role of brain norepinephrine in the onset of bipolar cycles. And uh, how do we know that? Uh, we know that because we treat them with lithium carbonate. Lithium carbonate regulates the norepinephrine level. Uh, and there's a problem with that. Uh, it, also, it not only raises you out of your depression, which is a good thing, but it also keeps you from having a manic episode. And that's what people don't like. It's also a heavy metal, so it's poison. Uh, so we have to monitor it. We have to make sure we're not killing you uh, while we're treating you for your problem. As not strange as that is. Uh, lithium carbonate has, been, has long been shown to be more effective than a placebo in treating the manic phase of bipolar 1 disorder. As I said, it raises your norep it makes it, it regulates your norepinephrine level. So if you have a low norepinephrine level, it will keep you from being depressed. If you have too high a norepinephrine level, it will regulate it, it will make it normal. A significant percentage of patients do not respond well to maintenance therapy. Toxicity can be a problem. As I said, it's a poison, it's a heavy metal. Uh, and for that reason, of course, we have to, to uh, constantly monitor you while you're on this stuff, it can build up in your system. It can build, it, uh, uh, it's like Coumadin, it can build up in your system. So this, this can be a problem because we can potentially give you a, a toxic level of lithium. Uh, many bipolar patients find the manic state to be enjoyable, all which affect the treatment compliance. And for this reason, these are the toughest guys to keep on their medication of everybody. You know, we were saying that, what was it, 50% uh, they will, uh, an individual taking uh, medication for schizophrenia will only stay on their medication for six months. Uh, and these guys, they don't stay on their medication either. Really tough to keep these guys on their medication. They uh, normally will be cycling. This is, this is how they discover they have bipolar disorder. And they love the manic cycle. They love it. Feels good. Feels like they're on speed. They hate the depressive symptoms, but they love the manic cycle. So they'll go off of it so that they can go on the manic cycle. They're just as stupid as the rest of us are. We think we're invulnerable, that nothing bad will happen to us. They think that if they go off their medication, they will go into the manic phase. And they won't have a problem with the depressive phase. They're wrong. And that's when they commit suicide. 
of all of the, the uh, mental illnesses where suicide is a possibility, this is the highest. This is the worst. People who are, on, uh, who are bipolar uh, commit suicide at a higher rate than anybody else. Schizophrenics, uh, uh, anorexics, uh, they, these guys commit suicide at a higher rate. And it's because they won't stay on their medication. And they don't stay on their medication because they love the manic phase. There are no psychotherapies that are effective alone in treatment of bipolar mania or psychotropic or psychotic depression. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy addressing problem uh, solving, stress management, communication skills, and relapse prevention may be helpful in overall treatment adherence and cognitive therapy may also be beneficial component of the treatment. The reality is that this is a, a fairly functional psychosis. Schizophrenia is not functional at all. You're not functional. You don't uh, understand what reality is. These guys are psychotic, but they're fairly functional. As we see from some of these actresses, you know, Winston Churchill was bipolar, and he was very functional, relatively functional. When he was depressed, though, he was a mess. Uh, this is Margaret Sullivan. Uh, if you watch old movies, uh, maybe you've seen her face. Uh, she was a very famous leading ladies in the, lady in the 1940s, 1930s and the early 1940s. Uh, she was a favorite of, of most of the popular leading men of, the, of that uh, time period, and she made several movies with uh, Henry Fonda and Jimmy Stewart. And you can still see her, if you watch old movies, uh, acting with Henry Fonda and Jimmy Stewart. She was Henry Fonda's first wife, Margaret Sullivan. Uh, she had three children. At age 50, she took an overdose of barbiturates and died in her sleep. She committed suicide. She had bipolar disorder. Guess what happens next? Are you ready for this? Remember we were talking about a genetic component to this? Eight months after her mother's suicide, daughter Bridget Hayward uh, took an overdose of barbiturates and died in her sleep. That was eight months after her mother committed suicide. So we still got two kids left. We're okay, right? We still got half the babies. All right. Yeah. Bill Hayward was the baby of the Sullivan Hayward family and went into the family business as a film producer. His mother was a famous actress, of course, and his father was a film producer agent, and his sister Brooke was an actress. Brooke Hayward. He made hippie films with uh, Peter Fonda, that's Henry Fonda's son, because they were kind of brothers, not really, they weren't actually blood related. 48 years after his sister and mother's suicide, Bill shot himself. Killed himself by gunshot, which leaves one. Rook is the only one that survived. Mom committed suicide, sister committed suicide, brother committed suicide, and only one of them survived out of four. Ouch. Uh, suicide is by no means always associated with severe depression, but a much higher proportion of individuals with diagnosed depressions commit suicide than in the population at large or in other diagnostic categories. Suicide has become a serious problem for the military. Uh, more, more men have died uh, from suicide. More, com more uh, Vietnam combat veterans have died uh, from suicide than died in combat. 57,000 men died in Vietnam. And we're approaching 100,000 suicides of men who were in Vietnam. <coughs> um, in uh, Afghanistan in 2012, there were more suicides in Afghanistan than there were combat deaths. It's very common in the military, unfortunately. Bipolar disorder was associated with the highest risk for males. Substance use disorder was associated with the highest risk in females. This is really kind of a tragedy. Uh, as far as the military is concerned, because one of the problems is that the military doesn't talk about it. They don't admit that they've got all these suicides going on. Well, they rarely admit it. Uh, they were doing that under the, in the Obama administration. They were actually talking about the suicides, because this became a, an issue uh, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Really serious problem. Uh, one of the most serious problems I had while I was stationed in Germany uh, was the fact that we had so many suicides. Um, 
It was really kind of, kind of an odd situation. We weren't even in, in a combat situation. It wasn't that stressful. So one of the problems with being in the military is that, if, especially if you're overseas, uh, you're in an a, a, uh, environment that doesn't like you. If you're in Japan, if you're stationed in Japan, well, I, I said they didn't like you. That's not really fair. Uh, they, you, they're very difficult to interact with, the Japanese, unless you speak Japanese and have studied the Japanese. Uh, you really don't understand their culture. Uh, same thing was in Germany. Uh, you would think the Germans are just like Americans, aren't they? Except they speak funny, they talk funny, they look alike. Don't we all look alike? And the answer is no. They act, their, their, their culture is completely different from ours. Interacting with the Germans is, was difficult in Germany. Interacting with the Japanese in Japan was difficult. So you're in a, a situation where you feel alienated. And so sometimes the only people you have to interact with are other military members on base. And sometimes that can't be, it isn't always the most positive thing in the world. Uh, so what do you do if you're in the military? One of the things, that, what, what do you do if you're in the military? How, how in the world do you take care of the depression? What do you do? I'm just, I'm just wondering what all those guys are doing. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, self-medications. A lot of self-medications. And we, we see this every place. We, see, we saw it in Germany. We saw it in well, especially in Germany. Oh, God. They don't drink. They don't drink 12-ounce cans of beer. They drink liters of beer, okay? They don't mess around with, you know, 20 ounces. It's, it's a whole liter. Oh, God big, heavy glass jugs because of what Anyway, uh, yeah, so they drink. They drink, and that's, it's, it's a form of self-medication. Uh, what are they doing? Well, they're trying to combat uh, their depression. Uh, alcohol works, well, kind, kind of works on, on, on depression. So uh, suicide in the military is very, very serious. Uh, it was one of the things that, uh, that I was dealing with when I was in the military. Not my suicide, but I was dealing with other individuals committing suicide. <clears throat> no, I've always been a pretty happy fellow. <laughs> I never had to worry about it. And I don't drink, so. And, uh, I don't self-medicate, except with lemonade. Ah, uh, lemonade. Bipolar disorder was associated with the highest risk for males. Uh, substance use disorder was associated with the highest risk in females. Uh, so uh, as far as, as males are concerned, males suffering from bipolar disorder are more likely to commit suicide than just about anybody else. Uh, I told you about Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut is really kind of interesting because he tells you everything he's thinking. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut and his uh, mother committed suicide when he was 17 years old. Uh, he came home and found her dead in bed. Uh, she had taken an overdose of pills. Um, for the rest of his life, he thought he was susceptible to suicide, which really meant he was susceptible to, to depression. Uh, he said after he graduated from college, uh, after he came back from the Army, um, and I told you one of the things that happened to him when he was in the Army uh, was that he was in the firebombing of Dresden. He was, a, he was a prisoner of war. He was in the firebombing of Dresden. 420, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, he was in the fire <coughs> in the resident. Uh, so after he came back from, uh, from war, from World War II, um, he said that every day he would come home from work and uh, the worst time up for him was at dusk. And he would contemplate how he was going to com commit suicide. He knew he was going to commit suicide at some point in his life. And so he accumulated rope. He, he uh, accumulated pills. Uh, he, he had guns in his house, uh, but he couldn't figure out how he was going to commit suicide. But every day he had to fight the urge to kill himself. And it was always at the same time. It was always at dusk. And the reason it was at dusk was, guess, when he found his mom. He had come home from baseball practice. And it was at dusk and his, he found his mom. And that's why he always contemplated committing suicide. Fascinating guy, uh, Kurt Vonnegut. 
And it's really nice that this guy has admitted this. Most people do, do not show their vulnerabilities. Uh, even authors don't show their vulnerabilities, but he does. And so if you want to read uh, uh, of his struggle uh, with, uh, with suicide, uh, then you can, uh, I, I can give you the titles of select books that he wrote. Uh, fascinating guy, really funny, really, really funny guy. He has since died, of course. Um, he died, he uh, fell. Uh, down this down step, he used to live in New York City, and he fell down uh, the uh, steps in his brownstone and hit his head, and uh, he survived for a couple hours, but then he died. Anyway, okay, so what are we talking about here? Suicide. Uh, not everyone is in, at equal risk for suicide. There are strong gender and ethnic uh, associations. Uh, who's who commits suicide more than anybody else? White males. White males. Yeah. Hey, we're number one. <laughs> Chris is proud of me. <laughs> I'm number one. All right, I'm number one. Uh, males su succeed at suicide at nearly four times the rate of males, of uh, females, and represent almost 80% of suicide deaths. Although males complete suicide more often, females make nearly three times as many suicide attempts. Suicide rates are much higher among white and Native American, Alaska Native males than other groups, but white males are, are still on top. We're still on top. Okay. <laughs> Age is more of a significant factor in the likelihood of male suicide than female suicide. Uh, I've got some statistics for you in just a second. Stressful life events. In one study, those who had attempted suicide reported four times as many stressful life events as did individuals in the general population sample, and one and one-half times as many as in the depressed sample. Uh, so it has to do with stressful life events. The more stress uh, us white guys are under, and please don't put me under stress. <laughs> Wait a minute, what, I need to talk about getting your stuff in. Okay. <laughs> uh, I do need to go home uh, this summer, okay? And I can't. I have to have all my grades in by the 14th. So you need to have all your stuff then, done by the 14th. The more of you, of you that turn in your stuff on the 13th, no, you can't turn it in on the 13th. <laughs> on the 12th, uh, the more stress you're going to put me in. I'm not... I'm not saying anything's going to happen. I'm just saying that I want to leave, okay? It's time for me to go. Uh-oh. What? You need that? Uh, so we're talking about stressful life events. We're talking about uh, white males committing suicide more frequently than anybody else. And I am a white male. I have one good thing going for me. I'm old. So younger white males are more likely to commit suicide than us old farts. There are two general types of events present more often in lives, lives of the suicide attempters. Interpersonal conflicts. Um, oh this, is, this is really kind of tragic. I'm going to talk about another reservation. This is where I used to work up north. Uh, we were okay while I was there. Uh, after I left, uh, there, were a, there was a cluster of suicides. And it, I'm sure it didn't have anything to do with me. It probably had more to do with the fact that there wasn't somebody to talk to okay, than the fact that they were committing suicide because I left. Okay. Uh, but almost in every case, uh, these individuals committed suicide because their, girl, their girlfriends had broken up with them. I know. It was, uh, it was insane. I mean, it was insane to commit suicide. Uh, one guy, his... Uh, significant other who he had a baby with, uh, broke up with him and started dating somebody else, and he walked out in front of a semi. Can you imagine? I know. Uh, it's going 70 miles an hour. Wow. Another guy, uh, his girlfriend broke up with him. So we went out in the middle of nowhere, and actually, if you go up to Montana, everywhere is the middle of nowhere. Okay. But he went out where nobody could find him. He hung himself from a tree. And they didn't find him for like five days. It was a mess. Didn't go into the rest of it. Uh, yeah, but uh, a lot of suicides. It always had to do with somebody breaking up with somebody else. Uh, there was this brilliant guy. He was, he was in medical school. And uh, his uh, girlfriend was one of my students. And uh, this guy was driving home. She had just called him on the telephone and told him that she was breaking up with him because she was in love with some 40-year-old guy. 
Uh, but uh, on his way home, he just, yeah, accelerated up to 100 miles an hour and went flying off the, the road. Single, single car accident. No reason for it whatsoever except for he was upset. Anyway, a lot of times this is the problem. Interpersonal conflicts. Uh, males, and, and you know, you guys can make fun of males all you want. You know, we're, we're hard-hearted bastards and, and uh, we, we, we jump from one woman to the other. But the reality is, this is one of the reasons why guys commit suicide, is because of interpersonal conflict. We really do. We do. We jump off the lover's leap. Yeah, that's what, uh, why they called it lover's leap. Anyway, interpersonal conflicts, very, very common. Uh, serious illness is another reason. Uh, or somebody sick in your family is another reason uh, that you might commit suicide. But the interpersonal conflicts are the thing that, that, that wipes people out more than anything else. They just can't handle it. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, suicide and how suicide works. As you can see, uh, the group of individuals who commit suicide at the highest rate are whites. Number two are Native Americans. Uh, Hispanics and blacks, way, way down. Like half the rate for, for, for uh, you guys and, and, and me, me guys. <laughs> me and you. <laughs> and the Asian and Pacific Islanders are way, way down as well. But as you can see, the white males commit suicide at a much higher rate than just about everybody else, except for you guys. That's it. There we go. So we're so sensitive. You guys need to be nicer to us. Everybody needs to be nicer. <laughs> to males because we're so fragile. <clears throat> Beckler in 1979 studied 127 cases of suicide and proposed that suicidal acts could be grouped into four categories according to their meaning in, uh, to the person. Suicide represents an escape from an intolerable situation and we do see that from time to time. Uh, well, from time to time. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, interpersonal conflicts. Uh, for suicide, it's an act of aggression. In other words, uh, you're going to feel sorry when I'm gone. You're going to be crying when I'm gone. So it's an act of aggression. Uh, suicide can be an act of sacrifice or in, in relation to some higher values. Um, I'm committing, well, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful life. Uh, he was going to commit suicide so that his family could get the insurance money so that they could pay off the uh, loan or something, whatever it was. Anyway, so it's an act of, su uh, of sacrifice. Suicide performed on the context of games or undergoing an ordeal in order to prove oneself. Uh, and of course, males challenge one another one all the time. And then they do stupid things like the Jackass movie. Isn't there two of them? Jackass 1 and Jackass 2? Are there three of them? A couple of those guys are dead because they did something really stupid and actually killed themselves. So that would, that's the fourth reason. Uh, most widely supported indicators, uh, previous suicide attempt, if somebody has attempted suicide before, as I said, you, if, you, uh, if you read Vonnegut, you find out that this guy was contemplating suicide. Uh, he actually didn't attempt suicide, but an individual that has attempted it once is more likely to attempt it again. If this is an acceptable, something acceptable, uh, if it was acceptable before, then if you're under a stressful situation, it's going to be acceptable again. So if you've attempted suicide once, you're more likely to attempt it a second time. Uh, contemplate it, uh, if you've contemplated the method at hand, uh, those individuals that uh, have a means of carrying it out, uh, this is one of the reasons why guns are so dangerous. Emory's not in the room, so I can say this, but uh, gun, guns are dangerous because it gives you a ready way of, of committing suicide. If you have to hang yourself, it's not very, it, it hurts. But if you shoot yourself with a gun, it's almost instantaneous. Instantaneous death, you don't feel anything. So guns are one reason uh, why individuals uh, uh, might uh, potentially commit suicide. Uh, with suicides, uh, you, if you have a gun in your house, you're more likely to die by your own hand than you are somebody coming in your house and killing you. So if you have a gun for safety, you're actually more, it's more dangerous for you because you might shoot yourself. Okay, uh, male gender, males are more likely to commit suicide than females. Hopelessness, if you have a feeling of hopelessness, um, and of course that, that is a risk of suicide. 
a diagnosis of mood disorder or schizophrenia, along with anorexia nervosa, epilepsy, personality disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. These conditions are associated with increased risk of uh, successful suicide. Um, previous psychiatric admissions, of course, then you're more likely to try to commit suicide because you have potentially you have one of these problems. Okay. <clears throat> one is usually intensely suicidal for only a short period of time. This is something that you have to remember. And this is one of the reasons why if you can get to this person before they do it, then you'll probably save their lives. <clears throat> it is the depths of despair. That's when you commit suicide. But remember, the human brain wants to feel good. It wants to heal itself. It wants to keep itself feeling okay. So if you can catch this person before they do it, and keep them from doing it this time, then the probability of, of them uh, committing suicide in the future isn't as high. But all you need to do is catch them the first time. You have to catch them before they do it. So if you have somebody that is suicidal, you just need to stay with them. You need to pay attention to them. Uh, you need to make eye contact with them. One of the interesting things about people that are suicidal, they won't make eye contact with people. <laughs> They're afraid that you're going to read their brains or something. I don't know. Anyway, they won't make eye contact. So as long as you can make eye contact with, with an individual, the probability of them committing suicide is very, very low. So if you've got somebody, if you know that this person is suffering, if you know that they've gone through some of these things that uh, uh, potentially will, if, they're, if you know that they're hopeless, or they're feeling hopelessness, uh, but especially if they're going through an interpersonal conflict. Oh, what did the interpersonal conflict go? There it is, interpersonal conflict. If they're going through something like this, staying with them is a really, really good idea. Don't take them out to get drunk. <clears throat> if you drink alcohol, it takes away your inhibitions, so you're more likely to do something stupid, like pick up a gun and pull the trigger. Uh, all the times I worked in the emergency room and somebody came in and they, because they either shot themselves or they shot somebody else, uh, because they were drunk, because they don't think about it, you know, if you, we had this one guy, I think I told you this story, this one guy had, he had 44 men, and he was playing football. <laughs> Do I need to tell you the rest of the story? Well, actually, he was playing quick draw, and every time somebody walked past the door, he would do the quick, quick draw thing. And uh, somebody came in and said, hey, don't do that, you might, the gun might go off. He said, it's not loaded, put it in his mouth and pull the trigger in the person. And they brought him in, he was still alive. We worked on him for hours. I will tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> uh, accidental suicide. He, he shot himself in the back there, or he shot himself in the mouth. Stupid, stupid, stupid stuff. Okay, what's going on? Okay, so they're only going to say suicidal for, an, for a very, very short period of time. And if you can catch them in that short period of time, you can stop them. They're not going to stay suicidal for hours. They're not going to stay, stay, stay suicidal for a week. It doesn't work that way. It's only for a very, very short period of time. This has to be extremely painful for the brain. Remember, we want to feel good. We want to, we want to heal ourselves. So they can't stay suicidal for an extended length of time. It's like trying to stay depressed. You just can't do it. The, your neurons in your brain are, are upregulating the serotonin so that you get every ounce of happiness that you can possibly suck out of the, the atmosphere. That's what's going on. So they can't stay this way for an extended length of time. Uh, the aim of suicide prevention is to assist a person contemplating suicide to consider their alternatives and direct the person to resources for psychotherapeutic or other forms of help. So if we, if we started a, um, a uh, suicide heart hotline, all we would need to, if somebody called in, that is a positive, that's a positive act. We potentially could stop them because they've done, already done something positive by calling you on the phone. So all you have to do is talk to them. 
And if you can get them past this crisis, if you can make them laugh, if you can make them smile, of course you can't see them smile, but you can hear them laugh over the telephone. If you can do that, then the probability of them committing suicide is very high. And that's why suicide hotlines work so well. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what time is it? 33? Okay. Okay, so it, how, how do you feel about this? I'm going, I'm going to do the next two chapters. One of them has to do with substance abuse, and the other one has to do with uh, uh, children, children, children's problems. Does that make sense? Is that okay with everybody? I'm going to do, uh, should I do the children first, or should I do the uh, substance abuse first? Which is, more, which is more important to you guys? Children? Uh, I'd say substance abuse. Substance abuse, okay. Fine. That's okay, you can disagree with me. 50-50? Children? 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 children. children. You don't care? You do care. You do care. Me? Yeah. I can also, there's also a chapter about old farts and how their brains were goofball. You want, you want that one? Okay. You don't care? Yeah. Okay. Maybe substance abuse first, because we're talking about substance abuse now. If we talk about children, we have a happy ending in this case. Ah, well, that was, <laughs> <laughs> None of these chapters. <laughs> 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 You're oh, yeah, yeah. abnormal. <laughs> you want the elderly? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm not going to talk about that. children? Okay. Well, let's, let's go ahead and do children first. Uh, no, the old farts are just depressing. And that depresses me <laughs> because I'm... I, you know, I can identify with all this stuff. Okay. Yeah, let's do 13 and then we'll do 12. Uh, okay. Quiz on 13? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to talk about... the last quiz, 13? Yeah, but I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to write the one for 12. Uh, normally, I have this very same problem. I, I can get through the first 11 chapters... But then right at the end of the, the semester, I'm struggling to get the last two chapters in. So I do the chapter 13 first, the children's oh, okay. chapter, and then I do the substance abuse chapter. And that's why I'm going to do this one. Okay. But I'll, I'll write that, that uh, uh, quiz, I promise. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm also reading papers, so. Um, you don't do it, it's okay. To... What, you yeah. mean read the papers? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I better do the paper. Since I made you guys write those papers. Uh, neurodevelopmental and disruptive uh, b disorders. This is about children, of course. Uh, the DSM-4, these conditions were considered uh, within a larger category. Uh, disorders of infancy, childhood, or adolescence. Uh, however, the DSM-5 revision moves several of these disorders to other areas. You don't have to worry about this stuff. You never read the DSM-4. You don't really care about the DSM-4. Well, you didn't care about the DSM-5. But uh, you don't have to worry about this. This is actually a slide for me because, you know, I've been teaching this since the DSM-3, okay? So, and every time they change DSMs, I have, it changes my lecture. So I have, I have to worry about this stuff. There are two new classifications, neurodevelopmental disorders spanning childhood and adolescence, and then disruptive impulsive control and conduct disorders. Uh, it was created uh, by merging the impulse dysfunctions and, and some of the other stuff. Um, neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, intellectual disability, we're going to talk about what we used to call mental retardation. We don't use that term anymore. Now we talk about intellectual disabilities. We're going to talk about specific learning disorders. There are some individuals that are dyslexic, some individuals that have math problems uh, or uh, reading problems, I guess that's dyslexia. Uh, motor disorders, uh, communication disorders, uh, people that stutter, uh, people that have uh, problems pronouncing their R's, as my brother does. Autism spectrum disorders, and when we talk about autism, uh, well, when we talk about autism, we'll talk about autism. There used to be Asperger's syndrome, but we don't talk about Asperger's anymore. We talk about autism spectrum disorders. And, uh, and obviously, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, ADHD and ADD are some of the other things we're going to be dealing with. Uh, disruptive uh, impulse control, conduct disorders, oppositional defiant disorder is what we diagnose somebody that is very, very young, oppositional defiant disorder. If they can't get along in school, uh, later on, of course, if they, if they haven't learned to behave, 
We diagnose them with conduct disorder, uh, intermittent, intermittent explosive disorder. This is an individual that throws tantrums. Uh, kleptomania is somebody that steals. And pyromania is somebody that sets fires. Are these childhood disorders? Yeah, this is really serious stuff. Uh, and of course, uh, some of these uh, have to do with uh, uh, more serious uh, diagnoses. Uh, kleptomania or pyromania, of course, is uh, a di is a, uh, a diagnosis for uh, antisocial personality disorder. So some of the serial killers that we see, uh, if we think they have antisocial personality disorder, a lot of times we'll go back into their childhood to see if they were pyromaniacs, if they would, if they set fires. Is this really that important? Oh yeah, yeah. It means they don't care about things. Uh, did they torture small animals? If they did that, you know, puppies, kittens, uh, if they strangled kittens to death, if they uh, took insects and stuck pins and... I used to do <laughs> But I love puppies, and I love kitties, and I love kids, I love kids. These individuals wouldn't like children. Uh, what am I talking about? Okay, 19... Uh, for, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, disorders onset is during the period of biological development before the brain and the nervous system are complete, yet they are quite varied in their symptoms, etiologies, and uh, treatments. Boys are much more at risk than girls in several of these categories. Uh, why? Probably had something to do with what Emory was talking about, the fact that you have a much larger corpus callosum than we do as males. It seems to separate the two halves of our brain more uh, completely, and for that reason, we have more problems. Uh, Rett syndrome was removed from the, from the DSM-4. Uh, now it is viewed as a condition that can cause mental disorders rather than as mental disorder itself. Rett syndrome was exclusive to females, and it, it does. We don't uh, diagnose people with it anymore. Uh, and we'll stop right here. We'll pick this up next time, uh, talking about children. Four more lectures. That's all you have to put up with me. You know, unless you got me for more than one class. I sort of feel sorry for you, dear. <laughs> yeah, eight more lectures would be the fourth thing. No, ten, nine, nine, because we have a lecture tomorrow. Uh, she's starting to cry. It's <laughs> rolling up in her eyes. It's really kind of tragic.